Welcome to Lore Evolution, the show where we look at our favourite factions, technologies and characters from the realm of sci-fi and fantasy. Today we're looking at Star Trek's United Federation of Planets. The Federation is a beacon of hope for humanity. It's an idealised future where poverty, disease and war have been virtually eliminated. No one has to suffer indignity and the prejudices we see today are a thing of the past. Instead, humanity's sights are set firmly on the stars to expand our horizons and enrich ourselves. But this idea wasn't always so well defined, or so cleanly executed. The United Federation of Planets, as depicted in the original series of Star Trek, is present in concept, but not much else. It's likely we were never meant to get a good grasp of the larger politics of the Star Trek universe at this point. The original series is the most episodic of the franchise, meant to be enjoyed as high concept adventures of the week, a wagon train to the stars as the original pitch went. Because of this, the Federation is vaguely defined at best, but we do know some concrete information. Overall, the peaceful and more equal future is well illustrated with hints of a fully united Earth. Nationalism appears to be completely eliminated, with borders between nations themselves having become nebulous at best. The diversity on the bridge conveys this idea perfectly, and in general, systemic racism seems to be gone. There are a few things which work counter to this idealised future, however, mostly a result of the show being a product of its time. In the original pilot, The Cage, Captain Pike says he isn't used to having a woman on the bridge. And the episode Turnabout Intruder seems to say it's Starfleet policy to forbid women from being starship captains. There's also the mini mini skirts and the general hysterical reactions female cast members were often directed to make. So while this is a more racially equal future, many elements of sexism unfortunately continue to persist even into the 23rd century. And while Uhura and Sulu were never racially discriminated against, Spock is often confronted by hints of xenophobia. In almost every episode, Spock is seen by many of the crew as an outsider, despite the fact that his race is one of the founding members of the Federation itself, and his cultural differences are the subject of ridicule and even outright hostility. So while humanity as a whole has progressed to the point of being united as a species, the Federation and Starfleet aren't exactly prejudice-free, nor it seems are they entirely prosperous. While it's now common knowledge among Trekkies that the Federation doesn't use any currency, this idea wasn't present in the original series. In the episode The Trouble with Tribbles, Uhura asks how much a Tribble is to purchase, and the currency mentioned is credits. Captain Kirk in another episode also refers to the Federation spending a great deal of money on their training. But it's also the smattering of colonists, workers and miners whose depiction cements the image of the Federation as not entirely a post-scarcity faction. Shabby clothing, basic equipment, sometimes dangerous conditions. It seems on the frontier or on far-off worlds, the Federation is a little lax with its support. The exact size of the Federation is also implied to be much, much larger in the original series. Today, you can easily Google a map of the Federation and see it occupies less than a full quadrant of our galaxy. However, the original series implies it is the galaxy. In the episode The Mark of Gideon, Spock says this line, the wars between opposing star systems no longer prevail in our galaxy. And including the animated series here, over its five-year mission, the Enterprise journeys to the exact center of the galaxy, to its boundary, and possibly even outside, as Mark of Gideon implies. Looking back at the original series now, the Federation seems starkly unlike what most Trekkies have come to know as this futuristic utopia. But it's perfectly in line with Roddenberry and Gene L. Kuhn's original pitch for the show, being a space TV western. In the Harv Bennett produced movies, the Federation remains mostly unchanged in this depiction. The most notable difference is an explicit statement of a currency free economy. But for the most part, we simply see more of it thanks to the movies being set mostly within the Federation rather than deep space. However, it still maintains a gritty edge, with governmental organisations such as Starfleet clashing with civilian scientists, the general presentation of Starfleet being more militant, and criminal activity not being out of the ordinary. Overall, the Federation of the 23rd century, while advanced, is far from perfect, with internal political struggles and regions of harsh living. But in the next century, some improvements are made. The Next Generation brought back Dean Roddenberry as a full producer and writer to the franchise, which he hadn't been for about a decade at this point. And having become older and more red, Roddenberry's vision of the Federation became more bold, politically speaking. The Federation, as depicted in TNG, is the idealised utopia we've become familiar with. 
Society at large seems to be post-feminist, and the average crew member has become so used to aliens that not even a Klingon on the bridge raises an eyebrow for most people. One need only look at the TNG Honest trailer to see just how socially progressive people have become in the 24th century. Klingons appreciate strong women. We no longer enslave animals for food purposes. I have decided to allow my child to choose its own sex and appearance. I mean, if stuff like this was said now, do you know how many people would accuse the show of being Oh, wait, yeah... While on the subject of politics, to the annoyance of many in the comments section I'm sure, it seems in the interim of the original series in TNG, Gene Roddenberry got his hands on a certain manifesto. While the movies brought up the idea of no money, TNG goes heavy on just how thoroughly dead capitalism is in the Federation. Not only do people not use currency, corporate business doesn't come up once, replication technology effectively means the state provides for everything, and Picard even says people don't really care about material possessions anymore. However, this is the part which gets a bit vague and contradictory. In First Contact, Picard says, We work to better ourselves and the rest of humanity. Which is a subjective notion to say the least, which is perfectly lampooned by Deep Space Nine. I'm human, I don't have any money. It's not my fault your species decided to abandon currency-based economics in favor of some philosophy of self-enhancement. Hey, watch it. There's nothing wrong with our philosophy. We work to better ourselves and the rest of humanity. What does that mean exactly? It means... It means we don't need money. Well... If you don't need money, then you certainly don't need mine. While TNG and for the most part Voyager were content to largely portray the Federation as unambiguous good guys, Deep Space Nine was different. Not only was their main character a highly flawed individual in the main setting an unstable flashpoint, but as the series went on, some uncomfortable aspects of the Federation were uncovered, such as the infamous Section 31. Section 31 was a stroke of genius from the writing team, a Black Ops style unit not even known to most in Starfleet, who have been protecting the Federation by any means necessary. Add to this Eddington's turncoat criticism and some highly morally questionable actions by Cisco, and DS9 raises the not unthinkable idea that the Federation could actually be seen as the bad guys to certain people. DS9 also criticizes the Federation's relentlessly peaceful stance when it comes to dealing with other factions. Without Cisco, it's pretty likely the Dominion would have wiped the floor with the Federation. Although that has a lot to do with a more common thread in all the series, which is the portrayal of Federation and Starfleet leadership. Since TOS straight through TNG, and even the more recent Discovery, the higher-ups who run Starfleet and the Federation government are more often than not portrayed as ignorant, indecisive, and selfish. Until Section 31 came along, Starfleet admirals or ambassadors were the first to betray Federation ideals in favour of an easy win, and Federation politics politicians have largely been shown to be ineffectual. While there are notable exceptions to this, it seems commonplace for those on the frontier to be far more effective as leaders and in embodying Federation ideals. While many fans have objected to Discovery for destroying the vision of an optimistic future or making the show too dark, Discovery's portrayal of the Federation is perfectly in line with what we saw from the 23rd century stories, as are the Kelvin timeline movies. Personal conflicts arise between characters, hostility to the customs of other races, Starfleet leadership making morally questionable choices, nothing that the original series didn't do. The only difference is while that behaviour was mostly depicted in episodic adventures before, Discovery is almost entirely serialised, and we get to see the ramifications of such actions in more detail but it is the same 23rd century federation. Despite being thought of as a utopia, the United Federation of Planets does still have some problems. Absolute prosperity is not universal across the entire federation, and the vastness of the faction has made its leadership slow to take action in the past. However, its ideals and goals are absolutely still worth striving for, and the capacity for self-sacrifice and courage seen in our main characters is virtually unmatched. How the Federation will evolve in Picard, or, or if it still exists in Discovery's 31st century set third season, are burning questions I'm dying to see answered. Mr. Noah asks, are there any classic sci-fi movies or series that you would like to see get a modern remake? This may be sacrilegious to say, but I think Babylon 5 could be remade in excellent form. I already love the series, but it was a bit too far ahead of its time to really have the impact it should have. A reboot could shave off some of the more episodic stories and really dedicate itself to the main arcs because audiences are used to that now. Also with updated visual effects, production design on a larger budget, it could truly look stunning. 
I think it's an amazing universe and story, and a modern reboot on a, say, a premium streaming service could really give it the following it deserves. Something Worth Watching channel asks, will you review lesser known sci-fi shows like Alien Nation, Earth Final Conflict, or Sequest? The short answer is, I don't know. The long answer is, whenever I get requests to review certain shows I haven't seen, I have to weigh up the time commitment to the reward. If I haven't seen it, it means I have to spend a lot of time watching, plus the time it already takes for me to do a video on top of that. And unfortunately, I do have to consider the views, as this channel is part of my income now. So if a video on an obscure show that not many people have heard of doesn't bring in a lot of views, it costs me a lot of time and also money. This is something which happened to my Dark Matter video, and it's why I won't do a video on season 2 or 3 of that show. If making videos was just a hobby, I may take the time, but I have to think about it as a business and consider the numbers. So for the shows you mentioned, I don't know, we'll see. If you like my videos, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell icon to stay up to date on all my new uploads. Over on my Patreon, you can see videos up to a week early. Special thanks to all my patrons now appearing on screen. Hope you enjoyed the video, and until next time, have a good one, and as always, live long and prosper.